Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Telesius tonight. Now, we, tonight and just tonight, we're starting half an hour early, and I think this may have confused some people, although, well, welcome in, although we did try to sort of make it clear that it's uh, starting at six o'clock. I know that some people are running late, but we have to make a start. Just one quick announcement. Those of you who are, actually two quick announcements. First of all, the food is going to be here in literally um, five minutes, I was told. So you are encouraged to eat and drink. There is no alcohol today, unfortunately, but we have water. But usually there is beer, unfortunately we had some issues with the beer. Um, you are encouraged to eat during the talk. Um, there's no, there's no, 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 no harm in doing this. Hopefully, the piano will understand our bad manners. No, it's fine. Uh, and he can, he can also eat and drink during the talk and, and encourage to do so. What was I going to say? Um, just a quick announcement. So, food is sponsored by Tequila, who are our sponsors, and they focus on high performance computing. They make it very easy to parallelize your calibrations in Python, right? They make it really easy to calibrate in MATLAB and anything else. So you can take whatever code you write, add like three lines of code in Tequila and you can run it in a million machines. Apart from finance, they help with cancer research and they have done a lot of a lot to speed up the kind of things that would normally take, I was told by them, 14 years uh, run in a couple of hours. So this is actually uh, significant progress that these guys are doing in many different fields. So um, and they are uh, helping in finance uh, with collaboration and you can have some food at the back, uh, which is sponsored by them. And um, what else I was going to say? Telesians are about to run a summer school uh, in AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, this will happen, so no offense to Demiana, who's my boss at Imperial, as a matter of fact, it will happen at Oxford. It's not affiliated with Oxford, though, but it will run at Christchurch College, which I graduated from some time ago. And uh, that's where the place, it will be, it will be with full board, basically. You will stay at the college for four for four days, right? You will, and the curriculum includes deep learning. Uh, our colleague Matthew Dixon will be teaching uh, deep neural nets. Um, Ivan Shadankin and myself and Ed will be uh, focusing on everything, sort of in the run up to, to deep neural nets, and and, uh, and there will be a little. And the, on Saturday we'll do a a quick intro to Python. Those of you who have forgotten Python, Python libraries, and then Saturday, Sunday. Uh, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday will be the main course and it will take place at Christchurch. Um, if you are interested in that, if you are interested in registering, and you would be staying at Christchurch and dining where Harry Potter used to dine, uh, because it's all in the dining hall of Christchurch, and which is absolutely true, that's where Harry Potter dines still. And um, you know, lots of interesting, um, you know, still have those portraits and they do what they do. The no, no, they don't. Uh, but but they, 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 they look as if they do. So let us know. And without further ado, of course, I don't really need to introduce Demiana. Those of you who have done anything in quantitative finance, especially rates, will certainly know of him. Um, suffice it to say that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really think, I mean, I, I don't think I'm distinguished enough to introduce you. So I'll just get out of the way. And, That's um, fine. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, I would like to start by saying that you have got quite a lot of very you know, cutting edge and uh, important activities right now. Uh, I'm reading from you know, the Talasians uh, uh, here and this machine learning, data science, electronic trading, market making, high frequency finance, cryptocurrencies, automation, but this talk is about none of that, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to do something I never did in my career, which is talk about utility, which is very interesting because the moment you talk about utility, uh, practitioners leave the room almost immediately because how do you actually measure utility? How do you calibrate utility? How do you postulate utility for an investment, for an investor, for a trader, for a firm? Uh, for, for a country, it's very difficult. But the result we uh, are going to present today is qualitative. So I think it, it holds for a whole variety of utility profiles and it does not depend on us uh, you know, knowing exactly what kind of utility 
precisely a, a market player has, but only that this utility has some very qualita basic qualitative features. If this happens, there are very, very interesting consequences, and quite dramatic actually, on the way we measure risk. And essentially the message of the talk is that the way we measure risk and we set the trade limits to some, in some institutions, does not work, okay? And I will explain why. So the title is a little bit uh, provocative, purposefully so. Again, because when you talk about utility, people tend to be skeptical, so I had to put a quite uh, aggressive title to catch attention. And it's rough traders with S-shaped utility versus value at risk and expectations for. So before I start uh, the technical bit of the, tra of the talk uh, uh, and start going into detail, let me say that this is joint work with John Armstrong, who is uh, an associate professor at uh, King's College, London. Uh, and uh, we have uh, written uh, already a few papers about this result, so you find a full archive or SSRN report with a full paper. There is a Risk Magazine version that focuses on a particular case of the result, uh, mostly in Black and Shows and Complete Markets. It's quite recent. We have uh, the uh, Financial Times Magazine, The Banker, published the black and column on this uh, uh, result as well. So it has caught the attention of some of the press and the industry magazines. Uh, and the reason is indeed this very provocative result that says that essentially the risk measures that have been lobbied and campaigned for by the Basel Committee and a number of academics, uh, you may remember all the, the important uh, literature on coherent risk measures, well, these risk measures do not work in a very important way. So I'm going to start uh, with the agenda. So I will introduce uh, rogue traders. I say rogue traders to be kinder to traders, but actually it could even be any trader, really. And I explain why. And I will argue that these traders have the S-shaped utility that has been uh, postulated uh, and, uh, you know, uh, studied by the Nobel awarded uh, Kahneman and Tversky. Well, Tversky passed away, uh, but Kahneman got the Nobel award, um, I think I understand. So this is a very important the theory they, they did that was widely recognized and, uh, uh, you know, uh, appreciated. It doesn't tie directly with all these topical issues of artificial intelligence and you know uh, deep learning and so on. This is rather about classical psychology and economics, but it uh, uh, says a lot about the way agents in the market behave. So then uh, by postulating the traders of a shaped utility, and again, I will not say this utility or that utility precisely, but it's enough that it has a given shape. I will model traders as uh, individuals who try to maximize their S-shaped utility, expected utility, uh, by designing a suitable payoff. So the trader will try to find a payoff that uh, leads to a maximum utility in a way. And we will introduce some tools uh, that uh, are called low invariant portfolio optimization that uh, help a lot in optimizing the trader expected utility under constraints. The trader will have two constraints, a budget constraints. He cannot set up any portfolio. He has to uh, stay within a cost, clearly. And there is a risk constraint as well. The risk of the portfolio must, be, must not exceed a given target, okay? And this risk will be managed with value at risk and expenditure fall, but then we'll see the main negative result of the talk, that is that these two measures will not do anything to limit the trader's uh, expected utility. The optimum will be the same, with or without these risk constraints. So I will then make a proposal, what can help uh, the traders, uh, well, the risk manager, let's say, or the regulator impose 
some effective risk constraints. So evaluate risk and expectation fraud do not work, what could work? And what could work is another utility. So the trader is a given type of utility. The risk manager could have a different utility, classic risk averse utility, which I will explain in a minute. And this, uh, if this is used as a risk limit, it works. Then the trader cannot achieve the same optimum with or without risk constraint. So it does have an impact, and it makes explicit the fact uh, that the different parties in a bank have different objectives. People tend to see a bank as just one entity that tries to maximize some performance measure, return on equity, ROC, whatever. But actually, banks are very complex organizations where there are people with different objectives. The risk manager has an objective, the trader has another objective. And sometimes these objectives are in conflict, okay? And this makes it explicit. And then I will conclude with some uh, remarks and references. So let's get started. So Kahneman and Tversky, in their classical paper, observes that in the, they did a lot of empirical tests, interviews, and so on, and they concluded that individuals appear to have preferences that have an S-shaped utility function. In other terms, if this is the terminal wealth, then the utility as a function of wealth is uh, an S-shaped curve. Classic utility theory postulates that individuals are risk averse. Rational individuals are risk averse. If you have studied any economics, you will know this. Okay? So risk averse means that this is okay, but then you keep going down faster and faster. So when you have a loss, your utility goes down faster and faster. When you have a gain, it goes up slower and slower. So you care more, you are more worried by losses then you're happy about games, in, 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 put, to put it very roughly, okay? So that's the classic theory of utility. So in a classic theory of utility, you go down here, you know, you have a, a concave function, concave everywhere, not just on the right-hand side, concave everywhere, and this is a risk-averse uh, trade or individual. Now, Kahneman and Tversky say, this is not really how people behave. When this is roughly correct uh, for the positive wealth, uh, but in the negative one, some people have limited liability, okay? So <coughs> take a trader, for example, he loses uh, a lot of money, at some point uh, he is fired by the bank, whichever the losses of the bank after that point, the trader does not care much, really. So his utility will flatten. And that's because he has limited liability. A trader has limited liability. All he can lose is his job, okay? Which is not something you lose lightly. Clearly, it's important. But beyond that point, the utility does not accelerate down far, uh, faster and faster. It just goes flat. Or maybe if it's a very moral trader, he still worries for his previous institution. The utility could keep going down, but certainly not like this, okay? So you have more a pattern like that than a really a classic risk averse utility like this. So this is uh, uh, important uh, and uh, this is the, the starting point of our analysis. And uh, the point uh, is uh, some people, you know, the, the, the fact that this utility is as shaped can have several explanations. Some say that people are irrational, agents are irrational, or as I say rather, that agents have limited liability, okay? That is a much uh, uh, more uh, straightforward explanation in this case, you know? Uh, again, the trader cares about his pay packet, his bonus, clearly, and uh, he, he cares about that uh, primarily, and once he has lost the job, like, as I said, that doesn't really, you know, uh, prove that the utility will go down faster and faster. Rather, it should flatten. Now, we don't care about all the properties of S-shaped utility. One important property I should have mentioned, so let me go back to the uh, previous. And there is a lot of discussion, and there's a lot of theoretical features associated with this, is that the utility is not smooth in the origins. 
And it doesn't have to be the origin. It could be another point. Here I took the origin for simplicity. So the derivative on this side of this curve is not the same as the derivative on this side, OK? The left and the right derivative are different. So this is quite a number of economic uh, interpretations. But I don't really care about that. For us, this is not important. What, import, what is important is what happens in the wings of the utility function rather than in the core, OK? So we don't care about really the central features. What imp is important to us is the, uh, are the wings. So we introduced two definitions. Uh, which is the first one is an increasing function u, which you can think of as a utility function, is said to be risk seeking in the left tail if it is uh, uh, if it dominates this kind of power function uh, for every number that is negative enough from that one point onward going negative for an exponent that's between zero and one. Okay. So it dominates on the negative axis from some point onward, it dominates uh, a power function. And it's said to be risk averse in the right tail. So this is risk seeking on the left tail, the losses. This is right averse in the right tail, the gains. If there exists a, a positive number after which, going more and more positive, the utility is dominated by a power function with an exponent again between 0 and 1. Okay? So to give you an idea of what we're thinking of, uh, we could have a curve like this. This red curve is, is okay for us. It has the properties we need for our trader, for, for the result we have later to follow. It's not really concave uh, everywhere. Uh, and here, you know, it has some changes in convexity and concavity. But what matters is there is a point after which this is dominated completely by a function with the right pattern, OK? And similarly here, OK? So here it is, it dominates basically a convex function, which is a power function. And from here on, it is dominated by a concave power function, OK? That's all I need. And then in between, maybe here, you know, the trader is losing money, but not too much. And then at some point, he started losing money at a level that can threaten his job. Then it's clearly his utility goes down very fast when he's losing his job. But once the job is lost, it flattens due to limited liability. I'm making an example. But it could be also very different. You know, the important thing is in the, in the wings, we have this domination. It's dominated by this you know, uh, concave and convex functions, which are power functions. Yes. So this property of risk taking and uh, risk averse uh, on the different risk scales. Taking, yes. So is it important that you have um, that you put restriction in terms of uh, power function? I mean, well, no. It's just because you want to differentiate it this makes, stuff, or it makes the calculations easier. No. But uh, yeah, it, it, you could uh, try to prove it uh, uh, with other type of bounds. It's not tight. It just that it allows you to do the things very, very, um, you know, uh, reasonably. And uh, it's uh, relatively general as well. In fact, if it's limited, all that matters to us really is the limited liability. So the power function keeps decreasing, you know, uh, lower and lower. But here, at some point, you will stop, really. So I think uh, it's relatively reasonable, in a way. OK, so now let me formalize the problem the trader is going to look at in a market. If he has a shaped utility in general, or, or whichever utility the trader has, is going to try to maximize the expected utility of a given payoff. So he's going to actually design a suitable payoff f that maximizes the expected utility. So the trader will build a financial payoff that gives the maximum expected utility. That's what he would like to do. But he has a couple of constraints. Of course, he cannot design any payoff he likes. He has a couple of constraints. The budget constraint, the price of this payoff must be smaller or equal than C. And the risk constraint, the risk of the payoff, here I use larger and equal to L because my co-author insists in using 
for the payoff instead of the loss, which is the initial value of the position minus the value of maturity the, of the payoff, it takes the, the gain. So the value of maturity minus the initial value. And so you, you require a lower <coughs> bound here. But, uh, because it's a percentile on that. But it's essentially a limit on, on a classic risk measure. Okay? You can turn it around and then this becomes smaller or equal. So then budget constraint and risk constraint for a utility uh, expected utility maximization. Find the payoff F that maximizes expect utility, expected utility given a budget and a early risk limit. Okay? So let's see how we formalize this. We need a little bit of mathematical framework to do that. So the uh, obligatory, I would say, probability space is omega fp. P is the physical measure we use normally in, in quantitative finance and risk management. We also suppose we have a pricing measure, Q, and the change of measure to be described by a classic radom nikolaitis derivative, which is a general way to parameterize market price of risk and market risk premium, if you like. So this is the random variable that allows you to switch from P to Q. Uh, you can model it as a change of numerator, as a pricing kernel, uh, or state price density, there's several equivalent ways, okay? But this is the random variable that does that. And uh, uh, the price of uh, the assume fixed and constant interest rates for simplicity, it's not a requirement, but again, it makes the calculation simpler in the beginning. And uh, we assume that the price of the payoff F being sold is the classic risk neutral expectation of the discounted final payoff, which is the expectation under the physical measure of the discounted payoff times the change of measure, or the pricing measure versus the physical measure. And we can write this as an integral with respect to the original physical measure of the discounted payoff times the random variable that expresses the change of measure, okay? We make a few assumptions, technical assumptions that everything behaves nicely, there's no explosion or infinite. And then we start formalizing the problem. We assume that the investor preferences are uh, embedded in a function, V, that given two payoffs, F or G, these are two different financial payoffs, at the final time, the function tells you which payoff is preferable depending only on the cumulative distribution function, which is capital F of the payoff. So we, we assume that we have a function that can rank the payoffs in better or worse uh, if uh, depending only on their cumulative distribution function, okay? So expected utilities like this, for example, expected utility only depends on the probability low of the payoff and would be something like this, okay? So, we are, in other words, we assume that the investor preferences only depend on the low of the final payoff rather than on the paths. So, the investor preferences are low invariant, in a way, like, again, with expected utility. And uh, as I said earlier, we assume that the investor has a budget C uh, that, uh, uh, constrains the, the amount of money it can spend to build the payoff. And this is also uh, low invariant. Uh, and, and sorry, no, this is, this is the price we saw earlier. There is also risk constraints, and also this is low invariant. So it only depends on the low of the uh, um, claim, which is true for value at risk, expected shortfall. These risk measures only depend on the probability distribution of the claim and not on the, on the specific paths, okay, or, or, or scenario. Okay, so these are examples that I already mentioned of low invariant risk measures, so this is a little bit the setting. Now, in writing down the optimization problem, we want to find the supremum over all the possible payoffs, which are essentially measurable functions, random variables, of our preferred measure of the payoff, which again depends on the low of the payoff, the cumulative distribution function of the payoff, subject to a price constraint that again we write, we write as 
the price under the measure Q of the discounted payoff, which must be smaller or equal than C, and a risk management constraint, which says that the low of the product we are trying, we're seeking, must be in a given set. So for example, this could be the set of probability densities with an expected shortfall at 99% confidence level, you know, bounded by a given quantity. So it's a question, so this V function that we are maximizing, uh, how it corresponds to each utility function? It's the expected utility. Expect so you could define V of uh, F of F, like the expected value of yeah. U of F. And that's an integral of u of, uh, of uh, x times the low the density of f in x. So it is of that type, basically. Now, the first thing we try to do is to simplify this, this optimization pro pro problem by actually uh, introducing uniform random variables. So we want to rescale a number of risk factors, uh, random quantities in this uh, setting to uniform random variable. And we'll use the generalized inverse of the cumulative distribution function and also of the survival function. And uh, with this, uh, we are able to, to obtain a result that I will not prove here, but just mention. But I'll give you an idea of a sketch of the proof. So what's the argument behind the proof? So it, we need a technical assumption. The probability space is non-atomic, but then in this case, you can find a uniform random variable u such that the random encoding derivative, the market price of risk, uh, the change of measure from pricing to physical, is simply the inverse of the survival function of the random variable itself computed on a uniform. Okay? So you can always see this random variable as the rescaling to this function of a uniform. Okay? And also, we have the second point that if F satisfies the price and risk management constraints of the original optimization problem, then uh, also the inverse of the cumulative distribution function of F computed in the same uniform, the same, that's the point of the, of the result, satisfies uh, uh, the constraints. Okay? And this is also equal to F in distribution. Whenever you invert uh, the cumulative distribution of a, of a random variable on a uniform, you get a new random variable with the same low. Okay? It's, uh, it's a classic result in, in probability uh, 101. So this is the same low as F, but it's obtained by the scale the uniform. And this is uh, uh, equal almost surely with the same uniform, the scale it's equal almost surely to the original change of measure. So you can find a single uniform that rescales, reparameterizes essentially the change of measure for the pricing constraint and the payoff you're looking for, okay? And that's the, the key uh, uh, element we need in a proof of the main result. Now let me give you some intuition on this. People who work on copula functions might you know have some familiarity with this, but it's really a very simple theorem of uh, uh, probability. So whenever you have a random variable x with a continuous distribution function, the cumulative distribution function f of x, you can write x uh, either as the inverse of the cumulative distribution function on a, on a uniform, or as, uh, or as the inverse of the cumulative distribution function one minus a uniform. If u is a uniform zero one, also one minus u is a uniform zero one. So you have two ways to do it, and this is equivalent to writing the inverse of the survival function actually in u. So you can choose whether you want to do it with the CDF or with the survival, but you can always rescale a uniform and get your random variable. And now what we do, we could do uh, intuitively would be take the original optimization problem I mentioned. Again, the trader looks for a payoff f that gives the supremum of, let's say, expected utility or whatever criteria he has to maximize on f, subject to the pricing constraint and uh, the risk management constraint. But now, we make a substitution, we express the random variable f here 
as the inverse of the CDF on a uniform, and we express the change of measure here as the inverse of the survival function on another uniform. As long as the two uniforms are different, I have done nothing. I simply rescaled these two with their respective uniforms, which, which could be different, okay? So from here to here, there is no simplification, no approximation. You can always write any random variable as a rescaled uniform. But clearly, because these are two different random variables, you need to rescale two different uniforms, you and your prime. That's the point. Now, the previous theorem was telling us that you can put the same U you're using here, also here, and the constraint still holds, okay? Instead of rescaling two uniforms, we can rescale only one. And that simplifies the, the problem uh, enormously. But how do the random variables relate to each other? Do they, yeah, I them? show a picture that clarifies why it still works, right? Because what we are doing, we are taking uh, we are taking the u that should be here, because these are two different random variables again. So I can write them as a rescaling of uniform, sure, but of two different uniforms, not the same, because they are two different random variables. But I claim that if I kill this u and replace it by u prime, the same I'm using here, this constraint still holds. And the reason is, if you look at the picture, basically, let me, let me say something already here, and then I'll show you a picture. So f is an increasing function. So f minus 1 is also increasing. The survival 1 minus f here is decreasing. And so this is decreasing as well. So here I'm mixing kind of randomly. Well, it depends on the dependent structure between u and u prime. But I'm mixing two functions of u and u prime. But if I replace this u by u prime, then I have an increasing function times a decreasing function of the same random variable, okay? And this minimizes the product because I'm, I'm taking the multiplication in scenarios where this is minimal. Let me show you a picture. So the general case with two uniforms <coughs> would be like this. So suppose the second one, the survival function is decreasing. So I'm plotting it uh, in, I order the elementary event in the probability space to have a decreasing second function, but then the first will not be increasing because this is not the same u prime, it's another u, which can be more or less correlated with the pink, with the purple one, and so it will go, depending on the correlation, up or down in the different scenarios. But now I kill this u and I put u prime here as well. And now I have, clearly that this is an increasing function. So now I have one increasing, one decreasing. And when I multiply these two, this is smaller in general than these two, okay? Because I managed to multiply one, uh, the same point for the smallest possible version of the other. I mean, you, you can prove that this is smaller in a way, okay? Because this product will be smaller than this. Okay, the only thing you're saying is that the left is more what's on the right, right? This is yes. Okay. And this is the core of the proof. I mean, the, the real it's proof it's is a little bit point. more sophisticated. But this idea is coming from two gentlemen that are Hardy and Littlewood. Uh, I don't know if you studied mathematics, you might know. Pure In mathematics. particular, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, Hardy is the guy who kind of discovered Ramanujan, you know, the very famous. India mathematician who came to Cambridge uh, uh, after uh, you know he, he was sending some papers to Hardy and Hardy was uh, they were very strange but it was clear that this was something uh, very very important there so he invited uh, the guy and, and the story is quite famous but they also developed, made a theory of rearrangement, which, is, uh, uh, which has some inequalities that are related to the previous slide I showed and, and, uh, and that are quite uh, important, uh, more generally in, in pure mathematics indeed. So this is RD and this is Littlefoot. This looks a, a little bit, I don't know if you, if you agree 
this looks a little bit like Stan Laurel, actually, yes. you know? I agree. The two, the two <laughs> comics, uh, but it's Hardy, actually. <laughs> uh, but not, 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 not that Hardy, because it is. So uh, that's the only picture I could find, anyway. So let me then introduce the second theorem that we can prove using this trick. Consider again the optimization problem where now we kill u prime and put u also in the price in the, in the change of measure constraint. So now everything is low invariant here, okay? We have uh, the supremum of our criteria on the law of the payoff we are seeking, so we're trying to find the supremum of this criteria over all the payoffs f, depending only on the law of f given a price constraint, where now we have replaced the second uniform with the same uniform we use in the, uh, in the payoff we are seeking, and given a risk constraint that only depends on the law, again, of the payoff we are seeking, okay? Now we make the choice, so I wanted to formulate the problem in general, but now we make a choice that the criteria is the expected utility of the payoff for an S-shaped utility U, okay? So, and here by S shaped we mean not the, 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 the narrow definition of Kahneman and Tversky, but only the property on the wings that I mentioned earlier, okay? So, we also specify the risk constraint uh, as the property that the expected shortfall must be larger or equal than L. Again, remember this is on the gain rather than the losses, that's why we're larger or equal. It would should be more familiar. It would be more familiar to express this on the losses, and then you would have smaller or equal. But that's essentially a convention. Because the expected shortfall dominates value at risk, the result will also hold for value at risk. But we show it for expected shortfall, which is right now in many circles a more popular risk measure. Okay. Now. This can also be written when you write expected utility because it's just an expectation. It's the same if you re re write f as a rescale uniform again. Okay, so this is the same as this. You have the price constraint again depending on the same uniform u, and you could write also the expected shortfall as a, a property, a statistical property of the uniform rescale by f. So everything can be done in terms of a 0, 1 uniform. And that simplifies the analysis quite a lot because we can write uh, the problem. If we define, let me introduce the last definition, Q of X like the survival function of the change of measure in X, then you can show immediately by using the fact that this is uniform that you can rewrite the, the full optimization problem simply as this uh, problem where we have used the uniform law. Find the supremum for all the functions phi increasing of the integral from 0 to 1 of the uniform of phi of x, x is the uniform uh, realization here, the density of a uniform is 1, so here I get just a 1, the x, subject to the price constraint, so this is the change of measure expressed for the uniform, and this is the payoff expressed with respect to the uniform. The price must be smaller or equal than C, and the expected shortfall is written as 1 over P, P is the confidence level, integral from 0 to P of the payoff uh, in the X, and this must be larger or equal than L. So these are the, the constraints I'm putting on the payoff, phi, which is expressed uh, now with respect to, uh, as a law of a uniform zero one. And this uh, problem can be rewritten as this much simpler problem, thanks to this rearrangement and rescaling uh, result. Okay, so if you run uh, then the analysis of this, this is not uh, immediately straightforward, but it's not, uh, extremely difficult either. You can do, the, the, for the proof I refer you to the full paper, but I already explained the key idea that allows you to get here, and from here onwards is relatively straightforward. So what you can show for this problem is uh, that uh, 
Well, first of all, the price constraint is much easier to analyze in this setting. And we can show the following theorem, which is the main negative result I will present this, this evening. Let U be a sha S-shaped utility in, in the general sense that the wings of the utility function are dominated by the power functions I described earlier, okay? Concave on the right-hand side and, and convex on, on the left-hand side. Assume further that the limit uh, in zero of the change of measure random variable is infinite. So what does this mean? In the Black and Schultz model, this would mean, for example, that the real expected return of the stock uh, is larger than the risk-free rate, okay? It means that uh, uh, you have larger returns in the physical measure than you have respected returns, than you have in a risk neutral measure, which is kind of uh, uh, saying that you, know, you have a positive view on the stock. Now, if this is true, then solving the, finding the payoff that maximizes the expected S-shaped utility given a budget constraint and an expected shortfall constraint as the same solution, the, the, op, the same optimum level of the second problem where the risk constraint is eliminated, okay? So the risk constraint is doing nothing to reduce the optimal uh, expected utility that the trader can uh, obtain. And moreover, this, this expected utility is the best possible one because it's the supremum of the utility itself without expectation. So in other words, this constraint is completely irrelevant. This supremum in both cases, in both problems, is this supremum of the utility itself. Okay? Now, this is kind of uh, uh, annoying because it's saying that whenever you have someone who has limited liability, essentially, that's the property that matters. And he's uh, maximized the expected you know, payoff under limited liability, under a budget and risk constraint, the risk constraint, if it's an expected shortfall constraint, is doing nothing. Okay? Same for value at risk. And it's a, it, do, it does depend on L, right, on the level of the... Uh, uh, actually, uh, no. Whatever level of L you put, you can remove this, and this supremum will be the same for every L, actually. So it's rather strong result. Now, how is it possible? And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you what's really happening behind the scenes. Yes? It just like here we're assuming it's a shaped for trader, and you mentioned like the main risk is losing his or her job. Yes. But there's the reputation risk, so the trader might. There is. There is. So you could argue it's not S shaped and it's just. Well, reputational risk uh, uh, is that uh, pushing your utility down farther and farther as the you have already lost your job, okay? So you're out of the bank. Yeah. So yeah. you're no longer responsible for the losses. My way, maybe you initiated them, but now it's someone else. Mm -hmm. And they are managing the, the portfolio, but the, the losses continue and continue. Yeah. But, okay. you know, to you, okay, yes. maybe you're right. Maybe it shouldn't flatten. You should keep going down, but not, but not like this, yeah, yeah. You know, perhaps like this. Because it's the loss of the bank, but it's not the, the loss of the trader, you could argue he, he's just, he could be just gone. It's finished, market, yeah. yeah, but that means you know, he doesn't care anymore. Yeah. Because what I'm putting on the plot is the, the wealth of the bank, bank not that okay. of the trader. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so the trader at some point, is, is utility given the wealth of the bank, flat tense from that point onward. So let me show you how you, you build this optimal payoff. And not, not too surprising maybe, the optimal payoff is a sequence of uh, digital options. So this is after we rescale the uh, random variables with uniforms and the payoff is as a function of a uniform risk factor. <coughs> But basically what the, the kind of product that you use to show 
that the spectral fall constraint is useless is a digital option. And this digital option has a level K1 on a very large domain alpha 1. Remember the uniform is 0, 1. So the risk factor is, is 0, 1. Right? So it has a level K1 on a very large set alpha 1 and a very negative value K2 on a small set 0 alpha, okay? where it's very negative. So we're building a payoff like this. Now, don't be fooled by the picture. K1 can be very large, okay? But the point is that K2 must be much larger in the negative uh, space, even if in on a much, much thinner uh, set. And then as you move, them, move to the limit, you have to design the, pay, the payoff that's in such a way that when alpha goes to zero, K2 goes to minus infinity. And that's precisely what we do in the uh, paper. So why does this kind of payoff in the limit satisfy the budget constraint, satisfy the risk constraint, and maximize the utility to the largest possible value? Sorry, yeah. just out of curiosity, if you take the integral from 0 to 1... Is I'm it going to do it now. Okay, I'm going to do it in a minute. Yeah. So uh, I'll take your question after this because I might be already answering. I, I don't know. But. So let's look at a couple of things. So the first thing is the utility maximization, okay? As I said, the take, oh sorry, K1 uh, larger than one, the risk limit is negative, and we have uh, K2, which is defined like this. And you can see this is the confidence level, this is K1, and when alpha goes to zero, this goes to minus infinity, okay? So it has the property <coughs> we want here. Now, the expected utility in this setting is the integral of u of phi of x uh, in the x, but if phi, uh, if uh, you look at the phi we have here, which is constant in alpha 1 and equal to k1, and constant in 0 alpha and equal to k2, you just do the calculation in the limit for alpha going to 0, this integral becomes uh, u of k1. Okay, you can do the calculation and you can check that this vanishes even if it goes down to the limit uh, is, uh, in, a, in a good way and the limited, limit of the utility is uk1. The k1 you selected here. And you can take it larger and larger as long as k2, which is given by the second as a function of k1 and alpha, goes to minus infinity. And basically by fixing any k1 you can attain by through this expected utility function on this specific case, when alpha goes to zero, you can obtain any basically value of u, okay? And this shows that you can obta obtain actually the supremum of u as the solution of the optimization problem. Well, if we show that the other constraints are satisfied because this is under constraints, okay? So this is, the, as again, an example of S-shaped utility, but what matters are only the wing. But remember, this is in the before we rescale to uniform. So this is on the original payoff. This is after we rescale to uniform. So to, to do a like for like, I should you know, rescale back from uniform to, to the original uh, space. Which I do, I think, uh, in, the, in the other uh, constraint. So the budget constraint. The price constraint says that the integral of the payoff times the change of measure to go under the pricing measure, with we remove the discount factor or, or you know or you move it on the right hand side, this must be smaller or equal than a level C. Now, why do we manage to spend an, an acceptable amount of money for this payoff? Because as I said, you might argue as follows. This is going to be smaller and smaller. Okay, this is true. This is going to be to go to minus infinity, but on a smaller and smaller set. And in the limit, it won't matter in the price. What will matter is this K1, which will tend, when alpha goes to zero, will tend to be on the whole support, zero, one. So, and because K1 is very large, this will be very expensive. So you will break the budget constraint. The trick is, that as we go down to minus infinity here, the other factor of the integral goes to plus infinity, okay? 
the market price risk, uh, the change of measure goes to plus infinity. So even if this becomes smaller and smaller, it is weighted with an infinite function. So it keeps being relevant and lowering the price of the product. So this negative wing, this negative part, has an impact of this in, on this integral and allows you to control the budget. Okay? And if this were not going to infinity here, this wouldn't be true. Because then, you know, this product, the, as this vanishes, this would, you know, cost a lot of money. You wouldn't have any negative counterbalance on the cost. The cost would be only pos always positive, and for a very large K1, this would cost a fortune. It's this negative thin part weighted with this infinite market price of risk that allows it to reduce the payoff and stay within the budget constraint. Okay? So that's why you need this assumption that this Q goes to infinity, which I made in the beginning of the theorem. <coughs> and the risk constraint then, the risk constraint is uh, this red one. This is the spectral shortfall formula in a, in a uniform setting. This must be uh, larger or equal uh, to all, well, because we're measuring it on the gains rather than losses again. And so as K2 becomes more and more negative, you know, when you take alpha going to, to uh, zero, the spectral shortfall takes, for example, P equals 0 0.99, which will be close to one in practice. It can be kept above, above a given level L as it has an average, basically, of this phi in 0p, essentially. And uh, so the risk constraint can be kept satisfied uh, as you move to the limit, essentially. Okay. So, because there is no other function to weight this, when this shrinks, in this case there is no problem, okay? just to average on a smaller, smaller set. So the conclusion of this first part uh, is that the value risk and expected shortfall do not work in limited rogue traders. And again, when I say rogue traders are traders that have X S shaped utility, but you could argue it's any trader, you know, not just uh, maybe except some very conscientious ones, but mostly would have limited liability as a feature. They don't have to be rogue to have limited liability, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to, you know, uh, have this paper out as an attack on traders. That's not the intention at all. So I'm using uh, rogue to, you know, perhaps try to be a little bit more um, uh, less uh, uh, drastic in the, in the conclusion. But essentially, if you have a trader with limited liability, value at risk and spectral shortfall do nothing uh, because you can design a payoff that satisfies the risk constraint, the budget constraint, and even if you remove the risk constraint, you get the same supreme than with or without the risk. So it doesn't matter. So the other question is then, what could you do as an alternative. Okay, so I mentioned what does not work in this setting. So the question is what would work? And what would work is a second utility function. So let me simplify even further. Assume that, uh, you know, this, this red curve is what we take uh, as the utility that the trader wants to maximize. Now, any real S-shaped utility will go negative here and flatten. So this red curve will dominate the utility. So if a risk manager is looking at the trader with this utility, this utility is better than a utility that goes down and flattens. So estimating the, the risk with this utility will be conservative. So if we can impose some risk constraints that limit this expected utility, this will be affected also with the S-shaped utility as before, okay? So to simplify the analysis, I put a very simple limited liability. I kill the utility on the negative axis to zero. And then I introduce a second utility, which is the utility of the risk manager or the regulator, R. 
And I say, these guys do not care if you make money. As long as you make a profit, they are not impacted. They have zero utility for, from you making profit. You know? They don't care about profit. They care about losses. Okay? So when the loss wealth goes negative, they, however, use a classic risk averse utility. Okay? The more and more the, the, the loss uh, goes negative, the faster the utility goes down. Okay? So that's the classic rational uh, utility. We argue that the traders do not have this, but now I'm saying that the risk manager could use this to limit the trader behavior. So two parties that play in the bank, one has a limited liability as a shaped utility, the risk manager has a classic risk averse utility. So in this case, we can show a result that is more uh, interesting. We need to assume uh, that the investor or trader utility goes to infinity when the wealth goes to infinity. So this doesn't have an, an, an horizontal asymptote here, but it keeps growing. It can grow smaller and smaller, but we need it to go to infinity in the infinite limit. Okay? So we need this condition. Now, if this is true, then the second result that is the following. Now, an investor with that shaped utility UI in the sense of the wings I, I showed in the beginning, who is subject to budget and expectation for constraint, can find the sequence of portfolios that satisfies these constraints and where the expected utility, S shaped utility, his expected S shaped utility goes to infinity. So basically, again, these constraints do not work because you can attain an infinite expected utility, which is the best uh, you know, uh, thing on Earth. And, 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 and clearly, the risk constraints do not uh, uh, work in this case. But now, let the regulator, so the regulator expected with, uh, equipped with an inspector short fall or a bar limit cannot stop the trader from attaining an infinite uh, expected utility, s shaped utility. Because the expectation for the main constraint remains satisfied as you go to the limit, which is similar to what we have seen with the digital option. Instead, if the expectation fall is replaced by a risk criterion based on an expected utility, and now I take a very simple utility. Uh, for negative x, I take a power function, negative power function, but now I require the exponent to be larger than 1 rather than smaller, which is what gives me the correct uh, concave you know, behavior rather than the limited liability one. I want the risk manager to go down faster and faster, so I want the exponent to be larger than one. Then any sequence of portfolios where the expected utility goes to infinity has this time the other expected utility going to minus infinity. So the, the risk manager will immediately block a, a sequence of trades like that because he sees that the, his utility of the risk manager, as the trader utility goes to plus infinity, his utility goes to minus infinity. So he said stop. Okay? So in this case, if you put a limit on this utility, a, a, a finite value, the trader will be definitely stopped uh, as he starts building a sequence of payoffs that get closer and closer to larger uh, s shaped utilities. <coughs> At some point, the risk manager will say, stop, because his utility is going to minus infinity. And once it breaches the limit, it will stop the trader. So at what precise limit this should be set, you know, that's a much harder problem. We're not uh, engaging that question at the moment. But all we're saying is that if you have this kind of limited liability on one side, the only way to stop the trader obtaining an infinite uh, expected utility is to use a second utility. Not, it's not the only way, but one way is to use a second risk averse utility. Because if you use a spectral shortfall, that doesn't change anything. If you use a spectral shortfall, the trader will still attain an infinite uh, expected limit liability utility. Okay? So this is uh, uh, a possible way. Not certainly not the only one, uh, 
uh, but uh, it's the first one that comes to mind. And the idea is that you're weighting the losses faster and faster with the classic risk averse utility. And this clearly has a very strong impact uh, on, on the risk constraint. It's much stronger than expected shortfall. So conclusions, and I think um, within an hour really, uh, so it's good. So value at risk or expected shortfall constraints fail with rock traders. They no, do not affect the supreme or expected utility a, a trader can get if he has s shaped utility at all. By contrast, let the risk manager not use expected shortfall, but impose a risk limit based on expected second utility, his utility, the risk manager, which is classic risk averse concave rational utility. Then this effectively reduces the supremum the trader with S-shaped utility can attain. And this works for many market models. So in the in the risk magazine paper we do it for black shoals, but in the general paper too we do it for any model, really a very general model. Now is this uh, uh, result uh, useful in what sense? I think it's useful to ring an alarm bell and say, guys, you're, you have pushed for a risk measure for years that is good in many respects, but has this very important problem, okay? So if you use this as a risk limit, in principle, you won't be able to, to stop uh, uh, the traders. And then, can we say what kind of utility should the risk manager use? You know, what is this classic? We said the power function. What exponent? Why, why a power function? Why not another steeply, even faster increasing function? Why not a slower increasing function? Well, we don't know. And then that's the problem I mentioned in the beginning. When you try to uh, talk to regulators or market players, the very notion of utility is difficult to estimate, to calibrate. You, you don't really, uh, you know, there's several types of utility for those of you who uh, studied economics, uh, you, or, and, uh, you know, you, you certainly know this. There are several family of utilities that you can use. There's not really a single uh, utility, and even if you choose a utility, what is the parameter? In our case, what would be the exponent? You know, if I tell you the regulator should use this utility, <coughs> what would be the exponent? And should there be a constant in front of it, right? I mean, this is very hard to, to estimate based on data. You, know, you, have to, you would have to analyze agents' behavior, but then every different bank has different people. It's very hard. So, However, I would point out that even value at risk or respect to shortfall have some degrees of subjectivity. You have to choose the confidence level, you know? And these two risk measures do not really tell you where the interesting part of the tail starts, you know? Suppose you measure, you, you, you are set to measure 99% value at risk, and you have two loss distributions. One has 99% of probability mass until here, and the remaining 1% next to it. This would be okay. But suppose the second one has 99% probability mass in the same configuration, but now the 1% remaining mass is here. Trillion loss, okay? The second scenario has 1% probability of killing your bank. The first one is a slightly larger loss than the 99 percentile, and you wouldn't care. The very problem of these measures is they don't look at the tail. They just, you, you tell them, I want to cut here, but is that a good point where you should cut? The, the two risk measures are agnostic to this question. They don't tell you yes or no. But expected shortfall does address this question. Well, well average. it averages, yeah, yeah. so it's better. But it's not yet, it's a, the average doesn't tell you much whether you have a bimodal distribution, you know, you take the average in between, or you have just a, a flat distribution going there, or just a Dirac delta in the middle. These are very different situations. The spectral fold has an average, so it tells you something, but it doesn't tell you the details of the tail structure, right? 
And if you have multiple modes or, you know, which is typical when you analyze credit portfolios, for example, when the correlation plays some tricks, these risk measures don't really probe uh, the tail sufficiently. So, but then, what kind of, so in the risk measure you have to choose the horizon and the confidence level. Here you would have to choose, well, the horizon as well, clearly, but then this power and maybe a constant in front of it. So also, you know, how do you calibrate those? It's not clear. And uh, it's even harder than choosing a confidence level that you consider, but because you can do some statistics to, to confirm that the confidence level is right, at least with value trees, you can backtest. But how would you backtest this is much more controversial. So. I am saying that this result is, is ringing an alarm bell. It's not saying that the regulator tomorrow should kill expectation fall and use this kind of risk measure uh, or risk constraint. But uh, I think this uh, is a point that uh, should be investigated further. That's what I'm saying. So we shouldn't stop here, but we should try to understand why a little bit better, build some other examples, see why a special shortfall does not work more in depth, uh, and see if there's uh, any alternative to this. It doesn't have to be utility, maybe we can find something else. But this is the first thing that came to our mind. Okay, so we'll stop here. Uh, if you have any other questions, I would be happy to discuss. Thank you very much. Any questions? No? Probably just <laughs> so it was. Uh, we, had that, we had the questions during the talk, so you know, it's good. But yeah, if there's uh, any other. So, the, so the, this uh, result is largely uh, relies on the assumption um, that this Q function goes to infinity. Yes, it, goes it does. Yes. So I'm just trying to understand what exactly does it mean. Is it a little bit, it seems to me it's a little bit artificial assumption that you're saying it's expressed some U of the of the stock behavior or a drift or whatever well it's, it's a very precise assumption for example in, in a model where you're in a diffusion model okay so if you have a, a stock price under the measure p and then you, you know that when you price an option you move under the measure q where the drift is the risk free rate times s so what we are saying is that the drift under the physical measure must be larger than the drift under the risk neutral measure so the expected return, instantaneous expected return of the risky asset, for example, in black shows, must be larger than the risk-free rate, which is one of the two cases. It's either that or it's smaller. But the market where uh, this is larger is a market where you would invest in the stock. You know? So you would build an increasing payoff in the stock and so on. A market where this is smaller is a market where you would short probably the stock because you expect the return that is smaller than the risk free rate. So, so that's that's the assumption we need, uh, really. And in the general case, okay, in the black shows it's very natural. In the general case, it's something that's saying something similar on the market price of risk uh, because you you should remember the market price of risk uh, is uh, for the random variable we have a scale it to zero one so going to zero corresponds in general to going to minus infinity really for a, for a continuum of values so I mean in the full paper we discussed the, the meaning of this assumption more but it's, it's clear already from the black and shows example it's meaning that the expected return the drift sorry of the risky asset and the line the payoff is larger uh, in the in the physical measure in the real world than it is in the risk neutral world yeah so yeah, it's, it's one of the two cases yeah, it's actually. essentially the, what the trader is thinking all right i can invest in this stock because of uh, anyway even though it's quite volatile but it on average my drift is larger yeah. than risk free rate so what I, due, to, due to my limited losses because of my s uh, special s shape or uh, utility I have, uh, I have uh, profits. But yeah, you need that to... That's why I don't care about uh, risk and uh, Well, yeah, but that's not the whole story. I mean, still, you would expect that the spectral shortfall should stop you at some point in the negative, you know, uh, day. 
but it doesn't uh, uh, apparently. So it's 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 kind of uh, uh, there's all these three moving parts. There's the the expected utility, the budget constraint, and the risk constraint that move together. So it takes a little bit to get used to to all of them together and to understand what's going on. But uh, we will try to, to extend the result to the other case as well. When the drift is the other way, I think we could probably try to build a case there too. We haven't done it yet. But it would be interesting definitely to see what goes on in the other case, yeah. So being mindful of the time, I think we'll call it a day for questions. Yeah. Uh, would like to thank Timiana once again. Thank you very much. Interesting. So um, I think that Hardy would be a little bit upset given his apology of mathematicians because that's actually a useful, yeah, a useful, <laughs> a useful and applied result where Hardy's results are used. And he always argued that mathematics has to be completely useless. Um, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. So it's not the first time they use Hardy <laughs> spaces in, in optimal control. You know, H so infinity control. Set up there. I mean, it's like he's a really. Uh, he's <laughs> Probably very angry by now. He's <laughs> getting quite angry. I mean, he's going to send some angels, I think, uh, you know, like to uh, you know, yeah. protest. But uh, that is an interesting point. And of course, another interesting point, I think, that there is this um, uh, space of robo advisors who are very actively looking at combining, in fact, the machine learning and utility functions. Yeah. And, uh, that would be probably very interesting. You know, build the utility from all the data you have. That would be fantastic. And you know, it would impact things like MIFID, where now the banks have, are, are obliged to explain the risk profile of their customers, their utility also in a way. And this would be, you know, quite interesting there too, I think. Yeah. So it must be of interest to some people who are doing risk here. Um, and thank you very much once again. Thank you, Damiana. That's a thank you very much. It's really to have you here. A quick announcement. I'll just switch off the recording for now. I mean, I think you know that the Talesians have been 